Hey, thanks, Craig. Hey, everyone. So I'm now going to begin today's reading of the essential works of Foucault. Foucault, man, what a scary, scary thinker. Um, and here I'm going to speak personally. Uh, very anxious about today. A little bit anxious. A little bit, a little bit fearful. A little bit fearsome. A little bit shaken in my boots. Edge of my seat. And that's because Foucault is one of my all-time favourites. And I say that despite not actually having read very much of him. He's still a very unfamiliar thinker to me. One who I point the finger to quite a lot. Foucault this, Foucault that. Oh yeah, Foucault, Foucault, Foucault. But I haven't seriously taken a deep dive into any of his major works. I've only read the essay and the lecture transcripts from every now and again. You know, the ones that aren't super, super long. I have a problem with reading books that are longer than 100 pages. The problem is called attention deficit. But despite anxieties and fears, I mean, this is definitely mostly for me. Um, This is a good excuse for me to just every week to get up and to just fucking read some Foucault. What more could I want? What more could you want? So I'm going to skip the uh, translator's preface, which basically says that Foucault is one of those fingers that comes across I mean, multi in a multimedia format. You know, it's not just his, his major works, not just his books. They are also his lectures. They're also his seminars. They're also his conversations, his interviews, his talks. So we're beginning with Michel Foucault, Ethics, Subjectivity and Truth, The Essential Works of Michel Foucault, Volume 1. The series editor, Paul Rabineau, and was translated by Robert Hurley et al. This is the New York Press edition. The contents, it starts off with four part one, we get acknowledgements, the preface to the series itself, then the introduction, which we will read, on the history of systems of thought by Paul Rabineau, and then the notes on both terms and translations, which will be important for us to have, at least at least have done here before we crack on. And then we'll move into part one, where we will stop after reading each section, beginning with the candidacy presentation at the Colique de France, 1969, followed by Foucault's The Will to Knowledge, and hopefully perhaps also the beginnings of penal theories and institutions and the punitive society, which come up in Discipline and Punish, and History of Sexuality, two of Foucault's major works. So it's only two pages, so I'll skip the preface. As I've said, it basically just says Foucault is one of those diverse thinkers that comes in many forms and shapes, spoken word and written word. And he died, unfortunately, at the age of 57 in 1984, just days after receiving the first reviews of his second and third volumes of The History of Sexuality. And a year previous to his death, when showing no signs of illness, he had written a letter indicating that he had wanted no posthumous publications. However, <laughs> Editions Gellemore had published its Ecri, well over 3,000 pages of text organized chronologically, that sought to collect Foucault's published works, prefaces, introductions, presentations, interviews, articles, interventions, lectures, and so on, and included his books. So although <laughs> Foucault asked to be so his works to be left as they are upon his death, only a year before he actually died, a few have taken to ignore <laughs> that heed of Michel Foucault. Um, I'm not too sure how I feel about it. I'm, I am glad in many ways. Foucault feels like one of those thinkers that we are needing more and more today. Um, some of the most prominent thinkers that we have today are responding, especially in continental philosophy as a whole, to the free thinkers that we are looking at these weekends, Lacan, Deleuze and Foucault. And Foucault perhaps being one of the most influential of the three, but that's not to say that <laughs> the other two weren't influential. Goodness, goodness, no. Um, all three are still finding their their ground. I think still finding uh, the fruits of their work. Still finding the long-awaited consequences of their philosophies and of their anti-philosophies. By Paul Rabinow, the history of systems of thought. Michel Foucault delivered his first lecture at the Colique de France, France's most prestigious academic institution, on December the 2nd, 1970, at the age of 44. He named his chair at the Collège the History of Systems of Thought. Systems of thought, he wrote, are the forms in which, during a given period of time, knowledges, savoirs, individualize, achieve an equilibrium, and enter into communication. 
Foucault divided his works on the history of systems of thought into three interrelated parts. The re-examination of knowledge, the conditions of knowledge, and the knowing subject. Faithful to the broad contours of this program, he moved increasingly in the last decade or so of his life toward an emphasis on the third term, the knowing subject. As part of his application to the Colique de France, Foucault had submitted a project of instruction and research on the knowledge or savoir of heredity, savoir being um, the French term being used, knowledge being the English translation of savoir, but there are other terms one can use too. The knowledge of heredity as a system of thought. The choice of heredity as a research topic is fully in line with the work he had carried out in cooperation with Georges Canguilhem, the historian and philosopher of the life sciences with whom he was working during this period. The project's goal was to expand the analysis of natural history and biology, which Foucault had undertaken in The Order of Things, one of his major works. How did it happen, he asked, that a non-prestigious set of knowledges, such as those surrounding breeding, eventually took the form and function of a science, une connaissance scientifique, connaissance being another term that could be translated into either knowledge or cognition. Um, we've seen this in on set on Sunday when we were reading Deleuze's 1950s seminar, What is Grounding, that the, that the translation for connaissance had been interchangeably um, translated to either knowledge or cognition, depending on the usage. How did it happen, he asked. That set of knowledges, such as those surrounding breeding, eventually took the form and function of a science, in connaissance scientifique, as important as genetics. In what specific fashion did this particular science take up more general historical events and enter into relations with other structures? The answers to these questions Foucault held would, would, would require philosophical concepts and detailed empirical inquiry. He wrote that whenever possible, he would employ a concrete example to serve as a testing ground for analysis. This deceptively simple rule of thumb provided him with a powerful means to counterbalance the weaknesses and to multiply the strengths of standard historical and philosophical approaches. He drew on existing resources, putting them to new uses. From the great French tradition of the Analyse School of Historical Analysis, or Anal, sorry, he retained the tradition of the Anal School of Historical Analysis, and he retained an emphasis on long-term and impersonal economic and social trends. From the equally distinctive French lineage of the history of science, he adopted an emphasis on concepts and epistemological rupture points. One could say, to simplify, that he sought to work at the nexus where the history of prax practices met the history of concepts. In 1966, Foucault had ended his most famous book, The Order of Things, impatiently awaiting the dispersal of the episteme of man. Thinking he discerned glimmers of an imminent reassemb reassemblage of language into a new form, in his inaugural lecture at the Colique, The Order of Discourse, he looked back at the 6th century BC. For him, it had been a time of, in quote, Greek poets speaking true discourse, inspiring respect and terror, meting out justice, weaving into the fabric of fate. Before the tragic rupture, a century later, when truth moved from the ritualized act, potent and just, to settle on what was enunciated, its meaning, its form, its object, and its relation to what it referred to. He solemnly announced that his project and the goal of his work was to question our will to truth, to restore to discourse its character as an event to abolish the sovereignty of the signifier. However, he would shortly abandon this nostalgia for a union of power, justice, and discourse in order to rethink the goal of overcoming the will to truth. He would abandon his attempt to look back at the time of the Greek poets just as he would forsake his state of alert, ever attentive to signs of a coming episteme. Nevertheless, he continued to think about how to move beyond sovereign regimes of power and discourse to question the will to truth. 
Earlier in the inaugural lecture, Foucault wondered, to quote, what has been, what still is, throughout our discourse, this willed truth, which has survived throughout so many centuries of our history? Or if we ask what is, in its very general form, the kind of division governing our will to knowledge, end quote. And he answered, quote, we may discern something like a system of exclusion, historical, modifiable, or institutionally constraining, in the process of development. This formulation is vintage Foucault. From his earliest publications, he had identified and analyzed the functions of systems of exclusions variously linked to scientific categorizations. He continued to produce analyses of the will to knowledge, but they gradually came to be situated within a different framework. The will to truth, on the other hand, maintains a rather obscure presence throughout his work. At times, he strongly contrasts the will to truth with the will to knowledge. However, almost simultaneously, it frequently seems to be totally enveloped by it. Apparently, at this point, as he entered the Collique de France, Foucault had not established an adequate conceptual framework within which to develop this opposition. I'd just like to add the opposition between will to truth and will to knowledge. Will to being a very Nietzschean inspired um, terminology. Um, as we'll see in the works of Lacan and Deleuze, we see the word will come up a lot in the what is grounding text, but in psychoanalysis and in the later works of uh, Deleuze and Lacan, we see that this term will, which also comes from Kant and their response to Kant and Nietzsche's response to Kant, the will will become replaced with desire. And that's not to say that they are the same, but definitely that is to say that there are many connotations that desire brings about that one can use interchangeably with will, the will to power or the desire to power. One can read will very metaphysically. <laughs> um, and that is something that I invite um, those who are reading this with us to to take with them as, as we go through a metaphysical will to power. But I also implore them to do the same with desire. To think about it in a very metaphysical sense and also to think about what on earth that could actually mean to think about these things in a metaphysical way, in a metaphysical way but whenever we do epistemology or ontology we are doing metaphysics uh, whether we like it or not whether us the Kantians among us <laughs> or whether there are humans among us Heideggerians everyone has their perspective on this of course um, but for reading Foucault, Lacan and Deleuze um, I hope to inspire at least that <laughs> moving forward there will be um, hopefully more of an openness an open invitation to the metaphysical approaches to these concepts even when Foucault always seems to be talking about power the courses the submission of course summaries was one of the few bureaucratic requirements at the college the summaries Foucault submitted are remarkably straightforward even didactic the courses themselves shared this pedagogical quality. Although they were often presented with exuberant humour and theatrical flair, they provide a series of preliminary sketches of extraordinary vitality and lucidity. It is essential to emphasise that the courses at the Collège were works in progress, philosophical historical expeditions in the search of new objects and new ways of relating to things. The courses can be best seen as exercises and not final performances. His inaugural course was entitled The Will to Knowledge, and he promised to explore fragment by fragment the morphology of the will to knowledge through alternating historical inquiries and theoretical questioning. The first year's course would provide an initial test of the place and role played by the will to knowledge in the history of the systems of thought. He began by attempting to clarify a set of distinctions between knowledge, savoir, and learning, connaissance. The difference between the will to knowledge, savoir, and the will to truth, verite, verite. Goodness me, I'm not too sure. The position of the subject or subjects in relation to that will. His reference to 
that will is mysterious, given that he has just distinguished two types. Although grammatically, the referent is the will to truth, Foucault immediately turned course to the will to knowledge. This condensation of the two wills arises in part from the figures Foucault chose to compare, Aristotle and Nietzsche, here are our metaphysical thinkers, and the manner in which he cast the comparison as exemplars extreme and opposed cases. Foucault interpreted Aristotle as representing the universal and naturalistic pole. For Aristotle, there is an essential pre-given harmony between sensation, pleasure, knowing, and truth. Our perceptual apparatus is constituted in such a way that it establishes a link of pleasure and of, above all, visual knowledge. Even when such a link serves no direct utilitarian purpose, the same economy extends all the way up the hierarchy through to the highest form of knowing, contemplation. As posited in the famous opening lines of the metaphysics, the desire to know is essential to who we are and is ours by nature. Our nature is to seek knowledge, and we take pleasure through doing so. Foucault offers Nietzsche's The Gay Science, on the other hand, in, as a total contrast to Aristotle's naturalism. Nietzsche's knowledge or connaissance is not an appropriation of universals, but an invention that masks the basis instinct, interest, desires, and fears. There is no pre-established harmony of these drives, and the world, just the contingent, temporary, and malicious products of deceitful wills, st striving for advantage, fighting for survival, and engaged in a ceaseless effort to forcefully impose their will on each other. Knowledge is not a natural faculty, but a series of struggles, a weapon in the universal war of domination and submission. Knowledge is always secondary to those more primary struggles. It is linked not to pleasure and flourishing, but harnessed to hatred and struggle. Truth is our longest lie, our most intimate ally and enemy. For more on this, I highly recommend reading um, an essay by Nisha, Truth and Lies in a Non-Moral Sense. And this is this would be very helpful as to when when perhaps going into um, Foucault's sorry Nietzsche's texts like Beyond Good and Evil, uh, Ecce Homo, <laughs> Gay Silence, Gay Silence, Gay Silence, and Gay Science, um, which are themselves responses to Greek philosophy, metaphysics, and German idealism, um, which includes Kant, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel and their positions on the history of philosophy. The interpretation Foucault gives of both thinkers at this moment, because it provides such an absolute contrast, does not allow for a fruitful distinction between the will to knowledge and the will to truth. He seems to affirm their functional identity in Western history as a distinction without a difference. Had Foucault chosen Aristotle's ethics, the Nicomachean ethics, where we find virtue theory first rooting in, in uh, philosophy, rather than his metaphysics as his paradigmatic text, these same relations of pleasure, knowledge, and the body would have been present, but they would have taken a different form. Over the course of the next decade, he would re-examine the elements of his reinterpretations of both Aristotle and Nietzsche and recombine them differently. Later on, Foucault would indeed become a good deal closer to posing the relations of pleasure, friendship, and practices of truth as a problem in a way reminiscent of the ethics. Although he would never adopt Aristotle's answers or his metaphysics. The move toward power. During the early 70s, for reasons his biographers have sought to explain in terms of his personal life, Foucault began to move away from these philosophical themes as well as the project on heredity. Rather, he devoted his courses to material directly related to the technologies of power. These themes will be treated more fully in volume three of this series. However, it is vital to an understanding of his eventual thoughts and ethics to underline several key changes here. In 1975-76, he entitled his course, Society Must Be Defended. 
the cause began with a despondent, almost despairing apology for what he characterized as his thinking's directionless drift. While he had intended to bring the work of recent years to completion in the current lectures, he was at a loss on how to do so. He lamented that, though these researches were very closely related to each other, they have failed to develop into any continuous or coherent whole. This confession seems severe given the publication of Discipline and Publish in 75, and in 1976, The History of Sexuality, Volume 1. Obliged to continue teaching, Foucault decided to take up the question of power relations. According to him, we lacked an adequate understanding of power as something other than a reflection of economic structures. Two alternatives were available, one that equates me mechanisms of power with repression, what we call the repressive hypothesis, and another that locates the basis of the relationship of power in the hostile engagement of forces. For convenience, I shall call this Nietzsche's hypothesis. The first model, associated with the 18th century philosophies and their precursors, proceeds from the social contract in which individuals give up their natural rights to a sovereign in a contractual agreement, peace and prosperity. From more see uh, Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. The model contains explicit normative limits. When the sovereign extends his power beyond the contractual stipulations, then his use of power can be called oppression. Legitimate power is finite. In the contrastive model, the couplet war domination, power is understood as a perpetual relationship of force whose only goal is submission. The norm of power has no internal limitation. Power seeks only victory. It is obvious, Foucault told his audience, that all my work ever in recent years has been couched in terms of the second model. However, I have been forced to reconsider it both because it is insufficient and because its key notions must be considerably modified, if not ultimately abandoned. This forced reconsideration follows from the conclusion that it is wholly inadequate to the analysis of the mechanisms and effects of power that it is so pervasively used to characterize today. A problem was coming into focus, and by the end of the year, Foucault submitted a crisp course summary. In order to pursue the concrete analysis of power relations, one must abandon the juridical model of sovereignty, a model that assumes the individual as the subject of natural rights or primitive powers. Foucault never seriously entertained a view of the individual as a bearer of natural rights. One can see this in what we call Neo-Aristotelian philosophy, um, which mostly took over the entire Western medieval period of theology in thinkers like uh, Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, who refer to natural law, natural rights, this naturalism, um, a principle that was discussed earlier in the text from Aristotle's Metaphysics, but that also comes up across multiple of his works, such as Nicomachean Ethics, something that had influenced pretty much the entire medieval theological period and still influences us today. There is an analogy between the figure of the individual endowed with primitive powers and the Nietzschean subject Foucault had invoked as the contrastive and polar opposite to Aristotle in his first years of lectures at the Collège. To the extent that the Nietzschean subject had itself been insufficiently submitted to genealogical scrutiny, it needed to be rethought. This is what I mean by the metaphysics of Nietzsche. There's a fantastic quote from, and this is referring to his, his genealogy of morality. Genealogy means not opposed to history as such, but solely with the discovery and the study of the origin points and the invention, the inventions of certain things. And the only reason why we say genealogy instead of history is because history has to be included within that. History is now seen more as a pluralist project. There is not one history, but there are several histories, each with their own genealogy. Morality has its own history, 
and its own histories, for there are many different moralities and many different histories. And this is what the genealogy of morality, morality sorry, attempts to do, one of Nietzsche's major projects, one that will lead um, pretty much every project that Foucault has. The questions Foucault posed in his 1975 to 76 lectures lend support to this re-examination. How and when, Foucault asked, did we moderns begin to interpret or dechiffer power relations as examples of warfare? Is warfare the general model for all social relations? How did an interpretation emerge that viewed the subject as endowed with primitive powers of antagonism, proclivities for war, mutual antagonism? When and where did a historico political discourse of war substitute for a philosophical juridical discourse of sovereignty? How is it that truths came to function as arms? How did it come to be that within such a discourse there emerged a subject for whom universal truth and natural law, droit general, came to be seen as illusions or snares? How did this sombre, critical, and intensely mythical form of self-understanding and practice emerge? Under what conditions did this figure arise who refuses the role of mediator, of neutral arbiter, a role philosophers have assigned to themselves from Salon to Kant to Habermas? How should we analyse a principle of interpretation that proceeds from violence, hatred, passions, revenge, that makes brute givens such as vigour, physique and force and temperament the underpinnings of thought that views history as a series of chance events what has been the trajectory of such a historical discourse that can be advanced both by barriers of aristocratic nostalgia as well as popular revenge pursuing this line of inquiry would make it possible not only to answer the question of how von Clausewitz became possible but more unexpectedly to pose the question of how Nietzsche became possible by the publication of The Will to Knowledge in 1976, Foucault had reshaped his understanding of power relations. He was also on the road to transforming his understanding of knowledge and the subject. Foucault coined the phrase, the speaker's benefit, for those who combined a discourse in which sex, the revelation of truth, the overturning of global laws, the proclamation of a new day to come, and the promise of a certain felicity are linked together. Foucault's sarcasm about this longing for a space of knowledge simultaneously outside formations of power and yet capable of undermining them all reaches its true and rueful culmination in the closing lines of the first volume of the history of sexuality to quote, the irony of this deployment is in having us believe that our liberation is in the balance, end quote. The highest form of irony is self-irony. Although the main target of the speaker's benefit was the, the reigning militant orthodoxy in France, Foucault was equally looking back over a path he himself had travelled. His true problem, he began to think, was the subject and its relations to the will to truth. Sorry to just quickly finish off a point that I, I had on this show a second ago. The quote from Genealogy of Morality is, there is no doer behind the deed, only the deed itself. Over the next four years, Foucault carried out a major recasting and consolidation of his core conceptual tools. The details of this complex rethinking will receive extended treatment in the introduction to volume three of this series. Nevertheless, it is again crucial to underline a central shift in his views on power relations, for it situates the problems that his later thought sought to address. During the courses of the late 70s, Foucault further refined his view of power relations simply and schematically. He concluded, quote, it seems to me we must distinguish between power relations understood as strategic games between liberties, in which some try to control the conduct of others, who in turn try to avoid allowing their conduct to be controlled, or try to control the conduct of others, and the states of domination that people ordinarily call power. And between the two, 
between games of power and states of domination, you have technologies of government. Understood, of course, in a very broad sense. To denote this broad understanding of government, Foucault used the term governmentality. It implies, he continued, the relationship of the self to itself and covers the range of practices that constitute, define, organize and instrumentalize the strategies which individuals in their freedom can use in dealing with each other. I believe that the concept of governmentality makes it possible to bring out the freedom of the subject and its relation to others, which constitutes the very stuff, matière, of ethics. Beginning from this premise, Foucault understands thought as the exercise of freedom. Now, while all of these lectures that we're reading on the weekends from Lacan, Deleuze and Foucault, the one feature that they have in common is precisely this idea of the subject, and all of them have referred to Nietzsche, especially Foucault. Deleuze only briefly, but later on he will <laughs> be referring to Nietzsche a lot. And it is this quote again, this idea of, there is no doer behind the doing, only the deed itself, only the act itself, that presents Nietzsche as a very vital philosopher on the concept of the subject. We've always seen the subject as this thing that wills, the one who chooses, the one who performs. But Nietzsche performs for us a very powerful inversion, which inverts pretty much the entire history of philosophical thought up until that point, which is that there is no subject, something which directly opposes Descartes' declaration of the cogito, I think, therefore I am. Nietzsche says not at all. <laughs> not at all. There is no thinking being there is only the movement of being itself, or what we call becoming. There is no subject except as the object of other forces and powers, other wills. You emerge. You don't emerge yourself. Cause a sui. Ex nihilo, out of nothingness. But there are points in which will can will freedom itself. There are specific points in which what we can call subjectivity may occur. Where finally, despite being determined in every aspect by outside influences and forces beyond our own willing and power, we conjure up something within us, or at least something is conjured up, which, through power and will, is able to overcome itself and in doing so, overcomes those outside influences. Which was also very deeply Sartre's notion of freedom. Freedom is doing what you can with what has been done to you. Signs of existence. In 1979, Foucault reviewed The Era of Ruptures by his friend Jean Daniel. Sean Daniel. Jean Daniel? Yeah. The editor of Parisian Weekly. La Nouvelle Observateur, to which Foucault had regularly contributed political commentary. His review, Pour une morale de l'inconfort, best translated as For an Ethics of Discomfort, for reasons that will be elucidated below, is a kind of editorial, a combination of praise, reflection, and advocacy, addressed to the journal's urban leftist audience at a time when their political and intellectual hopes were rather dampened. After the events of May 68, of course. Foucault set forth several guiding principles and themes to which he would return incessantly in the remaining years of his life, albeit in different contexts and using different forms. See, for example, What is Enlightenment? by Michel Foucault. He began by invoking a question posed in 1784, 1784 by the Berlinische Montagschrift to a number of leading Aufklärer, including Kant. What is enlightenment? The question, as well as Kant's response, would preoccupy Foucault over the next several years. These reflections provided him with a starting point from which to transform the newspaper's question and Kant's answer into a different question. What is modernity? 
or as he posed it in his book review, who are we in the present? What is this fragile moment from which we can't detach our identity and which will carry that identity away with itself? Good journalism required a passion for stalking the elusive singularity of the present. More challenging yet was the task of observing oneself with a certain distance in this processing in this process of practicing this metier. Midst the hurly-burly of everyday events, crises, deadlines, and myriad pressing demands, Foucault was intrigued by the fact that some journalists were better suited than philosophers and political activists, activists for the task of sustaining a supple yet critical stance in the swirl of passing scenes, of resisting the temptation to always have a position. Foucault praised Jean Daniel for his deft handling of this ever-renewed demand on the left to have a firm, well-defended vantage point for anchoring one's analysis. Vantage point, after all, is a military term, connoting an overall perspective from afar, the proverbial bird's eye view. But strategic advantage, however, does not necessarily provide understanding. For Foucault, in order to establish the right relationship to the present, to things, to others, to oneself, one must stay close to events, experience them, and be willing to be affected and affected by them. Foucault was not singing the praises of vacillation and indecision, or of a total refusal of perspective, banality of thought, resolute opportunism, or a program of deconstruction and transgression, as ends in themselves all seemed to him to be equally dubious. The demand, exigence, for an identity, he insisted, and the injunction to break that identity both feel in the same way abusive. Such demands are abusive because they assume in advance what one is, what one must do, and what one always must be closed to, which side one must be on. He sought not so much to resist as to evade this installed dichotomy. One might say he refused the blackmail of having to choose between a unified, unchanging identity and a stance of perpetual and obligatory transgression. One's way, or facul, of no longer remaining the same. He wrote, is by definition the most singular part of who I am. However, that singularity was never a blanket negation. If one knew in advance that everything, including oneself and the current state of affairs, was bad, what would there be to learn? What would be the sense of acting? Why think a life without the possibility of error would not be conceivable? One might say, following Julius Canguillum, such a life would not be alive. Who one is, Foucault wrote, emerges acutely out of the problems with which one struggles. In the review, he phrased his approach in a manner so as to distance it from Sartre and his version of the committed intellectual. Quote, experience with rather than engagement in. Privileging experience over engagement makes it increasingly difficult to remain absolutely in accord with oneself. For identities are defined by trajectories, not by position taking. Such an attitude is an uncomfortable one insofar as one risks being mistaken and is vulnerable to the perfect hindsight of those who adopt firm positions, especially after events have passed, or who speak assuredly of universals as though the singular were secondary. To that extent, one could say, adopting a distinction Foucault developed in his work leading up to the second volume of sexuality, the uses of pleasure, that this attitude is rooted in an ethics and not a morality, something that um, Deleuze underpins in his text Spinoza of Practical Philosophy. A practice rather than a vantage point, an active experience rather than a passive waiting. One might also find it useful to look up and read Walter Benjamin's theses on the philosophy of history, which um, talks exactly about this ethics of a morality distinction in regards to Marxism and historical materialism. The challenge is not to replace one certitude evidence with another, but to cultivate an attention to the conditions under which things become evident.
ceasing to be objects of our attention and therefore seemingly fixed, necessary and unchangeable. A few pages later in the review, Foucault approvingly invoked Maurice Merleau-Ponty's phenomenologist definition of the task of philosophy. To quote, to never consent to be completely at ease with what seems evident to oneself. Deleuze and Guattari refer to philosophy as such as the creation of concepts. What seems so new, if we are attentive, often can be seen to have been around, at the back of our minds, at the corner of our vision, at the edge of things we almost but never quite saw or said. To quote, the most fragile of passing moments has its antecedents. There is a whole ethics of an alert certitude, evidence again, which doesn't exclude a rigorous economy of truth and falsity. Far from it, but isn't summed up by that economy either. Philosophy is a practice and ethos, a state or condition of character, not detached observation and legislation. What is philosophy after all? If not, of, of, if not a means of reflecting on not so much what is true or false, but on our relation to truth. How, given that relation to truth, should we act? In this formulation, we see the thinker as a nominalist, engaged in a re-examination of knowledge, the conditions of knowledge, and the knowing subject. The masked philosopher. Foucault's exasperation with what he continued to see and feel as political posturing and lack of imagination in France, found another articulation in an anonymous interview he gave in April 1980 to the leading French daily Le Monde, which was interviewing leading thinkers about their views on the current scene. He refused to join in this vogue of condemning intellectuals, which was sweeping Paris in a part of rejection of the media and its supposed destructive influence on French politic political and intellectual culture. I've never met any intellectuals. I have met people who write novels and others who treat the sick, people who work in economics and others who compose electronic music. I've met people who teach, people who paint, and people of whom I've never really understood what they do. But intellectuals? Never. His sarcasm was aimed at what he saw as the reigning style of criticism, one based on denunciation, condemnation, judgment of guilt, and attempts to silence and ultimately to destroy the object of criticism. He lyrically but pointedly evoked an alternative. I can't help but dream about a kind of criticism that would not try to judge but to bring an over, a sentence, an idea to life. It would light fires, watch the grass grow, listen to the wind, and catch the sea foam in the breeze and scatter it. It would, not, it would multiply not judgments, but signs of existence. It, it would summon them, drag them from their sleep. It would bear the lightning of possible storms. We should remember that he agreed to the interview on condition that he remain anonymous, that, be, that he be referred to simply as the masked philosopher. Apparently not many readers guessed that Foucault, who many thought as the nihilist, the deconstructionist, had spoken these words. Well and good, the interviewer persisted, but isn't the present, after all, a time of mediocrity and lowered expectations? Foucault responded with an emphatic no to that commonplace as well. Quite the contrary, he insisted. It is a prop propitious, <laughs> propitious, <laughs> apologies time i'm going to say propitious but i'm not too sure there is an overabundance of things to be known fundamental terrible wonderful funny insignificant and crucial at the same time there is an enormous curiosity a need a desire to know curiosity is seen as futility however it evokes care it evokes the care one takes of what exists and what might exist a sharpened sense of reality, but one that has never immobilized before it, a readiness to find what surrounds us strange and odd, a certain de determination to throw off familiar ways of thought, and to look at the same thing in a different way, a passion for seizing what is happening now and what is disappearing, 
a lack of respect for traditional hierarchies of what is important and fundamental. I dream of a new age of curiosity. We have the technical means. The desire is there. There is an infinity of things to know. The people capable of doing such work exist. Curiosity, a simple little thing. At this time, one of Foucault's cherished projects was to create a different kind of publishing in France. After Editions Gallimard, the prestigious house that published his major books in huge print runs, refused his offer to edit a small series of books. Foucault, along with Paul Vain and François Valle, succeeded in convincing another distinguished Parisian publisher, Les Editions du Suez, to initiate a series entitled Works, or Des Traveux. The purpose of this series was to publish works that might be considered too long and difficult, hence lacking an immediate audience, but that over time would show their importance, short pieces outlining the main points of future work to be developed over time, and translations of important foreign works with no large market in France. Foucault and friends provided the trenchant definition of work as that which is susceptible to introducing a meaningful difference in the field of knowledge albeit with a certain demand placed on the author and reader, but with the eventual recompense of a certain pleasure, that is to say, of an access to another figure of truth. What are we today? Foucault asked his readers to ask themselves in 1979. At a moment of the globalisation of the economy? Certainly. At a moment of global geopolitics as well. But he wondered... Was for also in a globalising moment? It seemed to him that the answer was no. He discerned no indications of an emergent universal philosophy or political consciousness. In France, in his view, this contradictory conjuncture had yielded a stifling combination of ever more empty rhetoric allegiance to the receding utopia of a universal revolution, accompanied by a pervasive social conservatism. How then? to tear oneself away from that predicament. His almost visceral rejection of French bourgeois mieux was a long-standing one that he shared with other French writers he admired, such as Flaubert. A young Canadian interviewer's assertion that France had an enduring attraction for North Americans elicited this a retort. Yes, but now I don't think they came to Paris any longer for freedom. They come to have a taste of an old traditional culture. They come to France as painters went to Italy in the 17th century, to see a dying civilization. That is why, he explained, he had lived in Sweden, in Poland, in Germany, in Tunisia, and in the United States, and had made repeated trips to Brazil and Japan. During the late 70s and early 80s, Foucault's main areas of political and social activity were outside France. He went to Iran for an Italian newspaper as an eyewitness to the period leading up to the fall of the Shah and the triumph of the Khomeini regime. Surely he had in mind a maxim he had applied approvingly to Jean Daniel's work, that of not giving our unhesitant support or confiance to any revolution, even if one can understand each revolt. He was fascinated by the type of political action taking place. The massive presence of an underarmed populace in the streets, facing a police force and army among the world's most brutal and omnipresent. A revolution was taking place, but it was one that made the European left uneasy. It was hard to identify class dynamics, social divisions, a vanguard party, or political ideology as the driving force. These lacks intrigued Foucault. He was intrigued by the question of the role of religion in political life of the unexpected and resurgent role it was playing. He reminded his European readers that the sentence preceding Marx's famous phrase about religion being the opium of the people spoke of the world, sorry, the spirit of a world without spirit. Marx's famous phrase. He saw or felt or thought he saw hints of such a spirit and of a possible role it might have in forming the self in a different relationship to politics. Foucault mused that until his visit to Iran, he had only read about the collective will. In Iran, it seemed that he had encountered it in the streets and focused in determined, in determined opposition to the Shah. He wondered what to make of the vocabulary, the ceremonial, the timeless drama into which one could fit the historical drama of a people that pitted its very existence against that of the sovereign. 
Foucault was fascinated, perhaps above all, by what he saw as a demand for a new subjectivity. He felt he discerned an imperative that went beyond overthrowing a yet another corrupt, Western-supported authoritarian regime, an imperative he formulated thus. Above all, we have to change ourselves, our way of being, our relationship with others, with things, with eternity, with God. He grappled with this intuition, repeating a similar hypothesis on several occasions. What is the meaning for these people to seek out at the price of their lives, that thing whose very possibility we Europeans have forgotten, at least since the Renaissance and the period of the great crises of Christianity? Spirituality. I can hear the French laughing at these words, but they are making a mistake. Foucault intended to examine the issue of political spirituality and its changing relationships with self-fashioning as soon as he finished the seemingly interminable rewriting of the Greek and Christian books. In the early 80s, he proposed a two-pronged research project with colleagues and students at Berkeley on political spirituality and self-fashioning in the 15th and 16th centuries and the arts of socialist governmentality in the 20s. The latter project was linked to a dialogue he had undertaken with representatives of the main non-communist labor union, the Confederation Francois des Travailleurs Démocratiques, or the CFDT, on such matters as the future of the social security system. He was intrigued by the spirit of a seemingly futile efforts of solidarity in Poland, which he actively supported and with whom the CFDT forged close ties. Foucault went to Poland on a number of occasions, not just to meet and discuss the situation with various participants, but to seek out rather humble work as a bookkeeper. When martial law was imposed in December 1981, France's socialist government made only perfunctory protests. Foucault, like many others, took to the streets, and as Iran faded from Western public attention and Poland endured in the grey night of martial law, Foucault seriously considered working anonymously with the humanitarian group Médecines Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders, or of retiring to the countryside to practice spiritual exercises and tend to his garden. Although he did not pursue either of these escape fantasies, his increasing preoccupation with the theme of the care of the self dovetailed with his efforts to bring the later volumes of The History of Sexuality to completion. During this period, he made frequent visits to California and New York until the late 70s. He had been openly, if discreetly, homosexual in the then current French style. In the context of his work on the care of the self, though, he began to rethink publicly homosexual and homosexual relationships, embarking on a distinctive series of explorations and reflections on emergent forms of pleasure, sociality, and thought. In California, his explorations and reflections on gay life in San Francisco are well known. Less has been made of the fact that, when in California, he spent his days at the University of California in Berkeley, working in the libraries, talking with colleagues, holding seminars, and meeting students. It seems fair to say that Foucault was experimenting in his own life with the twin imperatives to know thyself and to care for thyself, a modern ethos. Max Weber, Foucault argued, had placed the following question on the historical, sociological, and ethical agenda. If one wants to behave rationally and regulates one's actions according to true principles, what part of oneself should, be, should one renounce? What is the aesthetic price of reason, he continued. For my part, I have posed the opposite question. How have certain kinds of interdictions become the price required for a certain certain kinds of knowledge or savoir about oneself? What must one know, connect, about oneself in order to be willing to accept such renunciation? The latter formulation is a guiding thread in Foucault's historical work in the second and third volumes of the History of Sexuality, as well as in the unpublished fourth volume, Foucault, sorry, uh, the fourth volume, Confessions of the Flesh. Despite his reformulation of Weber's questions, Foucault's core concern applies equally well to Foucault himself. What is the place of asceticism in a philosophic life? If asceticism is taken as exercise and not as renunciation, and this is precisely how Foucault takes it up in his later work, then the question becomes, how is reason exercised? How is reason practiced? One of the main themes Foucault explored in the early 80s was the care of the self, the nearly complete uncoupling of this imperative from its twin, know yourself, 
is an essential element of his diagnosis of modernity, in which the latter imperative was gradually to eclipse the former as a philosophical object. From Descartes to Husserl, the imperative to know thyself increasingly predominated over that to take care of thyself. As the care of the self had traditionally passed through or entailed relationships with others, this disproportionate weighting of knowledge has contributed to the universal unbrotherliness that caused Weber so much pain and which he lacked the tools to do more than decry. For Foucault, the equation of philosophical ascesis with renunciation of feeling, solidarity, and care for oneself and for others as the price of knowledge was one of our biggest wrong turnings. However, reversing such a course is not merely a matter of willing or desiring it to be otherwise. What could be more self-delusional than the recent heralding of a re-enchantment of the world, in, uh, in reference to Max Weber's disenchantment? Or that we have actually never been modern? As this trajectory became clearer to him, Foucault aimed at rethinking this separation. Rather than seek to force a reconciliation, he focused on whether the universal unbrotherliness produced by the will to knowledge, which had previously seemed like a necessary component of modernity, the price to be paid for knowledge and ethics might well be more contingent than Weber had thought. He began come by radically recasting that Weber would have called a vocation, something that Foucault called an ethics understood as an ethos. Care of the self. In an interview published as The Ethic of the Concern for the Self as a Practice of Freedom, Foucault provides an unusually un unqualified formulation of his philosophical and ethical work. He reiterates that his project has always been to untangle the relations between the subject and truth. Although his argument is not presented as a set of working premises, it is inconvenient and plausible to view it this way. Premise 1. What is ethics if not the practice of liberty? the considered refleshy practice of liberty. Freedom is the ontological condition of ethics, but ethics is the considered form that freedom takes. Thus, a condition of liberty is the ontological starting point. Premise two, in the Western tradition, taking care of oneself requires knowing oneself. To take care of the self is to equip oneself with these truths. It is through these tools and this conceptual linkage that ethics is linked to the game of the truth. Premise three, ethics is not just a theory, it is equally a practice, an embodiment, a style of life. Hence, the problem is to give liberty to the form of an ethos. Premise four, the subject is not a substance, it is a form, and this form is not primarily or always identical to itself. In response to Hegel's suggestion that the true or the whole is both subject and substance. Self is a reflexive pronoun, and it has two meanings. Auto means the same, but it also conveys the notion of identity. The latter meaning shifts the question from what is this self to what is the foundation on which I shall find my identity. Premise five. The central arena of inquiry is the historical constitution of these forms and their relation to games of truth. A game of truth is a set of procedures that lead to a certain result, which, on the basis of its principles and the rules of its procedures, may be considered valid or invalid. Why truth, and why must the care of the self occur only through the concern for truth? This is the question for the West. How did it come about that all of Western culture began to revolve around this obligation of truth? Given these premises, one must conclude equally that one escaped from a domination of truth, only by playing that game differently. Premise six, the relationship between philosophy and politics is permanent and fundamental. Very Guattarian, <laughs> Felix Guattari says the same thing. By politics, Foucault means both power relations and a life of, of the city as understood in the ancient world, the modern equivalent being governmentality. Premise seven, philosophy, understood as a practice and a problem, is a vocation. The manner in which liberty is taken up by the philosopher is distinctive, different, differing in intensity and zeal from other free citizens. Since the Enlightenment, while demand for an ethics has been incessant, the philosophical fulfillment of that demand has been notably scarce. This impasse has led to many fundamentalist projects, none of which has achieved any general acceptance. 
even amongst the, philosoph the philosophers and moralists. Woke moralists, such a meager harvest has also led to the categorical or partial rejection of such projects. Foucault himself argued in the order of things that there could be no moral system in modernity, if by moral system one meant a philosophical anthropology that produced firm foundations concerning the nature of man and thereby a basis for human action. Ultimately, though, Foucault may well be remembered as one of the major ethical thinkers of modernity. Foucault sets up two ideal types of moral systems, one that emphasizes the moral code and another that emphasizes ethical practices. Within the systems of the first type, the authority that enforces the code takes a quasi-juridical form. The subject refers his conduct to a law or a set of laws. The great monotheistic religious systems exemplify this type of moral system. In the second ideal typical form which Foucault associated with the ancient world, it is the mode of subjectification, the way a subject freely relates to himself, that receives a greater elaboration. In this type of system, the codes and explicit rules of behaviour may be rudimentary, while greater attention is paid to the methods, techniques and exercises directing at forming the self within a nexus of relationships. In such a system, authority would be the self-referential and might take a therapeutic or philosophical form. He stressed that, in practice, these forms were not wholly distinct. Subject-oriented practices have been widespread in Christianity, just as there were moral prohibitions in the ethical practices of the ancient world. Nonetheless, the contrast is an instructive one. In volumes two and three of the history of sexuality, Foucault undertook a restorative historical analysis of the place of the self-formation as an ethical subject in the ancient world. He describes this process as one in which the individual delimits that part of himself that will form the object of his moral practice, defines his position relative to the precept that he will follow, and decides on a certain mode of being that will serve his moral goal. His goal in this analysis was not to return to some archaic mode of social order, but rather to make visible a bygone way of approaching the self and others which might suggest possibilities for the present. He was not seeking to denaturalize the subject of desire, not to invent a philosophic system per se, but to contribute to a mode of living. He thought that elements of that possible mode of living were already in existence and he sought to learn from and strengthen these, not to discover or invent others. In that spirit, it seems worthwhile to turn to his ethical categories onto his own thought, something he himself did not do in order to identity and illuminate his singular enterprise. Spelling mistakes. <laughs> it says identity and illuminate. I'm pretty sure that's supposed to say identify. Coffee break. The ethical fourfold. Foucault saw ethical analysis as the free relationship of the self. Rapport à soi, or à soi. A relationship that could be examined through four basic categories. Ethical substance, mode of subjectification, ethical work, and telos, which means goal or purpose. Although he treats these categories as independent one from another, he recognises that, in any historical instance, they are always found in a specific configuration. In his genealogy of the subject of desire, he gives us historical examples of how such an analytics of ethics had been elaborated, of the internal systematic systematicity and of the differential mode of alteration over time. His goal in these historical analyses was to loosen the grip of our self-understandings as subjects of desire so as to make possible a different relationship to our thought, ourselves and others, as well as to our pleasures. However, as he wants as he won't as he was wont to say, there is more. What if one was undertaking not only a history of sexuality, but also a genealogy of ethics? How then would one cast the analytics of a free relationship to the self that a life of thinking entailed? In an interview in Berkeley on the genealogy of ethics, he was asked why he was not intending to talk more about friendship in his forthcoming books. He responded, Don't forget Lucige de Placer's The Uses of Pleasure is a book about sexual ethics. It's not a book about love or about friendship or about reciproc reciprocity. 
reciprocity, sorry. Friendship is reciprocal and sexual relations are not reciprocal. What I want to ask is, are we able to have an ethics of acts and their pleasures, which would be able to take into account the pleasure of the other? There are two important points here. First, Foucault makes it clear that the content of the ethical dis discussion he provides in volumes two and three of the history of sexuality follow from the subject matter under discussion. As we shall see, the general categories of ethics he provides can be elaborated differently in the context of a different genealogy. At the end of the Archaeology of Knowledge, he stated that it would have been perfectly possible to construct other archaeologies of other objects, and that he was never talking about the spirit of an age or a unified understanding of being. Uh, a term from Hegel, Zeitgeist, spirit of the time or age. Second, he is very clear that he is not advocating a return to the Greek model of sexual or human relations. Ancient Greek society was characterized by essential inequalities and non-reciprocities that moderns can only find tolerable. Consequently, what he identifies in the ancient world as a problematic, a way of thinking about ethical issues, and a form of practice, ascesis, integra integrally linked to that war. It should be stressed again, though, that when in 1984 Foucault was asked if he found the ancient Greeks admirable, he answered, not very. They were stimmied right away by what seems to be the point of contradiction of moral of ancient morality between on the one hand this obstinate search for a certain style of existence and on the other hand the effort to make it common to everyone a style that they approached more or less obscurely with seneca and epictetus that would be found the possibility of realization only within a religious style all of antiquity appears to me to have been a profound error laughter it is not entirely clear what exactly he was laughing at, certainly not the obstinate search for a style of existence. Was it the religious stylization? Was it the effort to make a stylized life common? The offending term appears to be common, understood as uniform. Foucault definitely rejected two possible interpretations of what common could mean, either that a class, location or professional identity was the sign qua non of liberty and hence of ethics or that everyone would, would have the same stylization. Foucault unequivocally equated the latter project with normalization and the will to knowledge, and there is no reason to believe he ever entertained the former, although the issue of leisure to pursue such questions remain unaddressed. This answer, perhaps appropriately, leaves entirely open how general and diverse Foucault thought such a project should be. Ethical substance, the will to truth, the way that the individual has to constitute this or that part of himself as the prime material of his moral conduct, Foucault. For Foucault as a thinker, the ethical substance, the prime material of moral conduct, is the will to truth. As we have seen in the course summary of his first year at the Collège, he summarized his comparison between Aristotle and Nietzsche, discussed archaic practices of establishing the truth in the context of justice, and elucidated the general goal of his work. The primary, perhaps ultimate task he had set for himself was to establish the distinction between the will to knowledge and the will to truth, the position of the subject and subjects in relation to this will. The lion's share of Foucault's work centered on the historical ana analysis of this rancorous will to knowledge. He did not abandon his attention to the dangers of knowledge power complexes, even as he cautiously moved away from the central focus on the will to knowledge. He categorically refused appeals to science, religion or law as the basis upon which a free person could shape his life. For him, whatever we were still to become, it could not be legitim legitimated by the will to knowledge. I would have said legitimized, but whatever. Still, of the will to truth, he said very, very little. In his 1971 essay, Nietzsche Genealogy History, he offered an utterly bleak picture of modernity. The will to truth loses all sense of limitations and all claim to truth in its unavoidable sacrifice of the subject of knowledge. In the order of discourse, he had told his audience it was as though the will to truth and its vicissitudes were masked by truth itself and its unnecessary unfolding. Sorry, its necessary unfolding. The as-though presents the smallest sliver of manoeuvring space. 
13 years later in the introduction to the uses of pleasure, Foucault formulated his problem thus. How, why, and in what forms is thinking constituted as a moral domain? A few paragraphs later, he could ingeniously write, As for what motivated me, it is quite simple. I would hope that in the eyes of some people, it might be sufficient in itself. It was curiosity, the only kind of curiosity in any case, that is worth acting upon with a degree of obstinacy. Not the curiosity that seeks to assimilate what is proper for one to know, but that which enables one to get free of oneself. Foucault presents curiosity as a modest impulse, but his qualification that curiosity is what enables one to get free of oneself, the telos of his ethics, signals that the stakes of this simple little thing could not be higher. But then, what is philosophy today? Philosophical activity, I mean if it is not the critical work that thought brings to bear on itself. In another version of the preface to the uses of pleasure, Foucault wrote, It is easy to see how the readings of Nietzsche in the early 50s has given access to these kinds of questions. Nietzsche does indeed provide access to these kinds of questions. In the gay science, he had already specified the problem. This unconditional will to truth, what is it? Is it the will not to allow oneself to be deceived, or is it the will not to deceive? He concludes, consequently, will to truth does not mean I will not allow myself to be deceived, but there is no alternative, I will not decide, even myself, and with that we stand on moral ground. Nietzsche and Weber are clearly Foucault's precursors in making these topics into problems. Mode of subjectification. Oh, sorry, mode of subjectivation. Uh, Felix Guattari uses the term subjectification, but it also depends on the translation. self stylization or form giving, the way in which the individual establishes his relation to the rule and recognizes himself as obligated to put it into practice. Foucault. Michel Foucault. What strikes me is the fact that in our society, art has become something that is related only to objects and not to individuals or to life. That art is something which is specialized or done by experts who are artists. But couldn't everyone's life become a work of art? Why should the lamp or the house be in an art object, but not our life? Q. Of course, that kind of project is very common in places like Berkeley. Foucault. But I am afraid in most of those cases, most of the people think if they do what they do, if they live as they live, the reason is that they know the truth about desire, life, nature, body, and so on. For Foucault, the challenge of the mode of subjectivation is not to base one's subjectivity, that multidimensional relationship to others, to things, and to ourselves, on any science, nor on any previously established doctrine. In What is Enlightenment, he wrote, I wonder whether we may not envisage modernity as an attitude rather than as a period of history. And by attitude, I mean a mode of relating to contemporary reality, a voluntary choice made by certain people, in the end, a way of thinking and feeling, a way too of acting and behaving, that at one and at the same time marks a relation of belonging and presents itself as a task. This belonging is a relation to the society in its historical and political determinations, with its embedded and embodied strictures, its sedimented orders of thought. The task is to determine what must be shown to be contingent, and what can be shown to be truly singular in the present. Something that has been muralized, um, I believe, at the University of Goldsmiths in the UK, a quote, um, from Mark Fisher's capitalist realism shortly after his death was spray painted on the wall. Exactly this, that what is necessary must be shown to be contingent, and that this is the basis for any emancipatory politics. An essential aspect of doing this work is to take up a stylized relationship to things, to oneself, and to others. The question is, what form should such a relationship take? In What is Enlightenment? Foucault presents two exemplary modes of subjectivation, one personified by Kant and the other by Baudelaire. Kant took up this question in, in an original way by transforming it from an issue of epochs or of pure reason into a question of the thinker's relationship to the present, to temporality understood as memory. 
Foucault restates Kant's question thus. What difference does today introduce with respect to yesterday? What difference does the present make to our thinking? For Kant, addressing this question put one on the road from an immature state marked by a lack of thought or reflection upon dependency toward maturity. Kant problematized the relationship between the will, authority, and reason. For him, thinking about the relationship of these terms was not only a process, but equally a task and an obligation. We are responsible for our own maturity. Consequently, it is through the obligation to work on ourselves that we may discover the way to a proper relationship to the Enlightenment. We will dare to know. Kant proposed the political contract with the rational despot, Frederick II, Frederick II, Frederick II, the sequel, an exchange of political subservience for the free use of the rational faculties. However, this contract was not something Foucault was willing to endorse. Baudelaire was also privileged in a particular relationship to temporality, characterized by keen attentiveness to the passing moment. However, he transformed the Enlightenment attitude into one of modernity. In his now classic manifesto, The Painter of Modern Life, Baudelaire identified the modern artist's challenge as one of seizing the eternal within the contingent, fleeting, and volatile present. What he saw was not behind or beyond the present, but within it. The artist had not merely to observe the carnival parading in front of him with the dis disinterested, ironic, blasé attitude of the flaneur, but rather to heroize, hero, heroize the present by taking hold, plender, of it. For Baudelaire, the artist has no right to despise the present. Hence, it is his business, through an act of will, to seize hold of it. Sorry for my French. <laughs> I'm not a French speaker. This is only half the story, though. The point of seizing hold of the present is to transfigure it. As Foucault understands it, Baudelaire's transfiguration entails not the annulling of reality, but a difficult interplay between the truth of what is real and the exercise of freedom. Transfiguration is not transgression. Transgression is a word Foucault does not employ in his later work. Rather, Foucault sought in Baudelaire to me uh, the means to invent a different attitude toward the world and the self, one more respectful and ultimately more difficult to achieve, just as he drew from Kant an attention to the historical singularity of reason as a practice. So, in a parallel way, and one closer to the original text he was interpreting, he drew from Baudelaire a stylization of the self as an exercise in which extreme attention to what is real is confronted with the practice of a liberty that simultaneously respects this reality and violates it. Baudelaire gives form to the self in art. He never imagined, Foucault insists, that such stylization could operate on society itself or on the body politic. Foucault proposes a stylization of the practices and exercises of the self taken as an attitude, a relationship, that clearly draws from the models of Kant and Baudelaire. However, unlike Kant, Foucault does not accept social and political conformity as the trade-off for freedom of thought. Equally, he refuses Baudelaire's restriction of a modern ethos to the arena of art. Rather, Foucault hopes to invent a mode of subjectivation in which the ethos would be a practice of thought formed in direct contact with social and political realities. Yet, if we are not to settle for the affirmation or the empty dream of freedom, it seems to me that this historico-critical attitude must also be an experimental one. I mean that this work done at the limits of ourselves must, on the one hand, open up a realm of historical inquiry, and on the other hand, put itself to a test of reality, of contemporary reality, both to grasp the points where change is possible and desirable, and to determine the precise form this change take. The relation to the present is one that tests the limits of society and of the self, a determination of what it is desirable and possible to change. To quote, this philosophical attitude may be characterized as a limit attitude. We are not talking about a gesture of rejection. Criticism indeed consists of analyzing and reflecting upon limits. But if the Kantian question was that of knowing, which limits knowledge must renounce exceeding, it seems to me that the critical question today must be turned back into a positive one. In what is given to us as universal, necessary, obligatory, what place is occupied by whatever is singular, contingent, 
and the product of arbitrary constraints. The point in brief is to transform the critique conducted in the form of a necessary limitation into a practical critique that forms or that takes the form of a possible crossing over of an obstacle. Such a crossing over or clearing away will always be historically specific and partial, to quote. This means that the historical ontology of ourselves must turn away from all projects that claim to be global or radical. I prefer the very specific transformations that have proved to be possible in the last 20 years in a certain number of areas which concern our ways of being and thinking, relations to authority, relations between the sexes, the way in which we perceive insanity or illness. I prefer even these partial transformations which have been made in the correlation of historical analysis and the practical attitude. To the programs for a new man, that the worst political systems have repeated throughout the 20th century. I shall thus characterize the philosophical ethos appropriate to the critical ontology of ourselves as a historical practical test of the limits we may go beyond, and thus as work carried out by ourselves upon ourselves as free beings. What is that work? Ethical work, critical activity for experience. The work one performs to attempt to transform oneself into the ethical subject of one's behaviour, what are the means by which we can change ourselves in order to become ethical subjects, Foucault? What we are to do, either to moderate our acts or to decipher what we are. The task of ethical work for Foucault is to establish the right relationship between intellect and character in the context of practical affairs. His clearest discussion of the, this relationship between thought and experience is found in the version of the preface to The Uses of Pleasure, where he states that his attempt in his work had been to develop a satisfactory means to analyse sexuality as a historically singular form of experience. However, as he indicates elsewhere, his general remarks about sexuality apply as well to other fundamental experiences. Not surprisingly, he differentiated his approach from phenomenological or existential approaches based on the subject and its primary experience. Rather, Foucault located experience and the subject within a complex site comprising a domain of knowledge, a type of normativity, and a mode of relation to the self. Thus, he addressed experience as a historical project, a historical product that emerges within a field of knowledge, a collection of social rules, and a mode of relation between the individual and himself. Foucault identified this overall project as a nominalist philosophic anthropology, explicitly rejecting any basis in pre-given essence or nature, without rejecting the possibility that some such constants can be found. He interprets experiences such as those of sexuality within the particular historical fields that shaped them, to which they were in part a reaction, and which both created and limited the form those experiences could take at any given historical moment. Many analytical, political and ethical problems could be developed from this nominalist understanding of experience, thought and subject. Foucault made this constellation of the privileged domain of the history of thought. To do so, he provides a rich, if idiosyncratic, definition of thought. By thought, I mean what establishes, in a variety of possible forms, the play of true and false, and consequently constitutes the human being as a knowing subject, as social and juridical subjects, and as an ethical subject. This definition establishes a terrain for the history of thought which is far broader than the history of scientific disciplines or philosophic systems. It posits all forms of experience as potential objects of thought, and thus of the history of thought. The task of the history of thought is to identify and delimit the development and transformation of these domains of experience, as these domains and these experiences are diverse. It follows that so, too, are modes of thought. Foucault's definition of thought as a modern praxis is so broad that it comes close to equating that not only with experience, but with action. However, it is important to avoid a misunderstanding here. 
as in a parallel way with Foucault's definition of power. Since four is a defining aspect of any historically singular complex, a vital aspect of its singularity, an analysis of such complexes is always possible for a history of four. But that does not mean that four or power relations, which are also an unsurpassable part of such historical singularities, is totally coextensive with the object of analysis. As Foucault put it, the study of forms of experience can thus proceed from an analysis of practices, as long as one qualifies that word to mean the different systems of action insofar as they are inhabited by four. In so far to the extent that qua, a classic and elementary philosophic proviso, that is often misunderstood today as totalization. In this light, we can make sense of Foucault's claim that thought is the very form of action. He is referring to a potential present both in the object of analysis and for the analyst. Thought is not what inhabits a certain conduct and gives it its meaning. Rather, it is what allows one to step back from this way of acting or reacting, to present it to oneself as an object of thought and to question it as to its meaning, its conditions and its goals. Thought is the freedom in relation to what one does, the motion by which one detaches oneself from it, establishes it as an object and reflects on it as a problem. Precisely because thought is not a given, thought is an action and actions arising from experience are formed by thought, are ethical ones. This brings us to the question of ethical work. It will have both an intellectual and practical dimension. Though, as we have just seen, experience and action arise from complex assemblages. As a thinker, the work Foucault performs to transform himself into an ethical subject of one's behaviour is a distinctive form of intellectual practice, a singular form of critical thought. He writes, Criticism is a historical investigation into the events that have led us to constitute ourselves and to recognise ourselves as subjects of what we are doing, thinking and saying. In that sense, this criticism is not transcendental, and its goal is not to that of making a metaphysics possible. It is genealogical in its design and archaeological in its method. It will separate out from the contingency that has made us what we are, the possibility of no longer being, doing or thinking what we are, do or think. It is sinking, seeking to give new impetus as far and as wide as possible to the undefined work of freedom. Such work would have multiple dimensions, but qua ethical work, it would be a disentangling and reforming of the power and thought relationships within which and from which the self is shaped and takes shape. Yeah, not a fan in the way some of this is written, Paul, but <laughs> it's fantastic nevertheless. <laughs> it's mostly just my reading. Thus Foucault came to conceive of the most general name for the practice he was seeking to identify, problematization. The proper task of a history of thought is to define the conditions in which human beings problematize what they are, what they do, and the world in which they live. Or again, in a more philosophical language, he defines his object of analysis as the problematizations through which the being offers itself to be necessarily for and the practices on the basis of which these problematizations are formed. It is vital to understand that for Foucault, being is given through problematizations and practices. They've used the term lettre, they've translated it from lettre, which means being, being with a big B, which isn't to say the small experience of existence, but to the grander, more metaphysical notion of the nature of existence itself, being with a big B. For Foucault, being is given through problematizations and practices. It is not prior to them. And that is why it is both potentially and obligatorily pouvant et devant, available for thought. As Foucault insisted, thought does not reside in the practices giving them their meaning. It is always a practice of freedom that could have taken, or could take in the future, a different form. Problematizations and practices can and must be thought vis-a-vis -vis experience insofar as they concern our freedom. Ethical work makes them available in that form. In an interview entitled Friendship as a Way of Life, Foucault presents a quasi-manifesto of what he sees as his own ethical task, cast as the work of thought 
pleasure and invention. Interviewed by several young French editors of a gay journal, Gay Pied, Gay Pied, <laughs> he is especially crisp in his formulations, speaking as a member of the community. The problem for gays now, he told his young interviewers, was not to uncover the truth of homosexual desire, but to make homosexuality desirable. Sex is not a fatality, it's a possibility for creative life. The search should not be for the secret of one's identity, but for how to invent new modes of relationship and a new way of life. How, that is, to become homosexual, rather than affirming that one already is so. I am not sure we should create our own culture. We have to create a culture. Could such a quest lead to a way of life not based on social class and other existing divisions? One that could be shared among individuals of different ages, statuses, and so on? One that could reopen effective and relational virtualities and invent the instruments of polymorphic, varied, and individually modulated relationships. He thought this was possible. And what needed to be problematized was the whole issue, the whole tissue of sociality. What was needed was not a means of making everyone the same, but of creating new modes of being together. Gays, Foucault told his interviewers, have come a long way in overcoming sexual renunciation. So perhaps they have an obligation to themselves and to others to invent a homosexual ascesis, a manner of being that today seems improbable. Ascesis is the work that one performs in oneself in order to transform oneself or to make, a self, to make the self appear, which happily one never attains. Can that be our problem today? To make the self a continuous creative task, a social experience, for gays, the problem might be how to make ourselves infinitely more susceptible to pleasure. We must escape and help others to escape the two ready-made formulas of pure sexual encounter and the lover's fusion of identities. Or, he asked in the same interview, what is friendship? His answer, the sum of all those things through which people can reciprocally give each other pleasure. A provocative answer, no doubt but what he means by pleasure is still not so very well spelled out. A few things, however, can be said about his use of the term. First, he is opposing pleasure to desire, as surface to depth, as the body to the person. He is seeking to break upon the equation of the forms of pleasure one enjoys and one's supposed identity. Second, his attention to pleasure does not entail embracing the doctrine of hedonism. Pleasure is neither the unique nor the highest good, but rather an accompaniment to other activities. Foucault's pleasure is embedded in a practice, an ascesis, one might say. It supervenes on other practices. For him, pleasure seems to function as a kind of ethical heuristic, in the sense that he suggests that where one encounters pleasures, one will be in the vicinity of experiences worthy of further reflection, experimentation, and reformulation. In another interview for a gay audience, Foucault insisted that gays should not privilege the model of individual rights or homosexual or heterosexual marriage, that is, rights to inheritance and so on, as important as the struggles to obtain basic rights and legal protections for homosexuality, were, Foucault argued, the real target was the general impoverishment of social relationships in contemporary society. Instead of treating the task as one of normalizing homosexuality in the heterosexual model, he urged his readers to try to invent something else. Such work, while arising within gay relationships, might be partially transposable to others, albeit with some imagination and tenacity. The problem, as he saw it, was to create new social forms. We should fight against the impoverishment of the relational fabric. Why not imagine new practices and eventually new forms of law that were not restricted to individual rights, but began from a premise of giving new forms to relational activities? This work is not only ethical, it is also political, but it is politics without a program. Telos. Disassembling the self. The place an action occupies in a pattern of conduct. It commits an individual to a certain mode of being a mode of being characteristic of the ethical subject. The mode of being to which Foucault was committed is captured in his ambiguous formula, to release oneself from oneself. C'est de prendre de soi-même. The difficulties of finding a correct translation for the phrase indicate some of the ambiguities that surround it. 
a falsely literal translation would be to untake oneself oneself but not only is the this phrasing alien to english and french but if the goal were to untake oneself how exactly had one previously taken oneself what self had one taken and who had been doing the taking the dictionary translation of c'est de prendre is to free oneself which captures captures the dimension of releasing oneself from a material entanglement but to free obviously carries an inappropriate philosophic baggage for it implies a, a pre-existent essential or true self already there to be freed another possibility might be detaching oneself from oneself although detachment can suggest as it does for the stoics an emotional distancing from the things of the world and in english the phrase connotes an aff affectless non-involvement and in fact Foucault is pointing to a certain self-distancing, and he advocated an exercise of detaching and examining parts that need to be cared for and ultimately repaired or replaced. Thus, the most adequate or least inadequate rendering might well be to disassemble the self, oneself. A phrasing that highlights the material and relational aspects of this exercise and introduces a notion of the self as a form giving practice that operates with and upon heterogeneous parts and forms available at a given point in history. Foucault reiterated that the goal, the mode of being of ethics as historically constrained, practical assembly and disassembly, when he asked, But what then is philosophy? Philosophical activity, I mean if it is not the critical work that thought bread but brings to bear on itself in what does it consist if not in the endeavor to know how and to what extent it might be possible to think differently instead of legitimating what is already known for is entitled to explore what might be changed through the practice of a knowledge that is foreign to it consequently say the ponde de swamim might be best understood as a form of continual self bricolage Levi Strauss's classic description of the bricolier or handyman constantly tinkering with heterogeneous objects, objects in which there was no clear distinction between concrete for aesthetic form giving and a subject's material practice, is helpful up to a point. So too, the bricolier's work on discarded and anonymous materials, reshaped and customized in a new way, seems apposite. Foucault points at such a conception when he asserts that. I insist that this change take the form neither of a sudden illumination that makes the scales fall from the eyes, nor an openness to every movement of the time. I would like it to be an elaboration of the self by the self, a studious transformation, a slow and arduous transformation through a constant care for the truth. Of course, the constant focus on the self, the care for the truth, and its reflectiveness separates Foucault's ethics from the cultural constructions of the handyman. But if we indicate the way in which this activity should be engaged, the questions of why we should do so remains. If Foucault was stingy in his explanations of the place and meaning of the will to truth, he is only slightly more generous in providing material about the telos of his own thinking. There are, however, some scattered and suggestive indications. For example, he wonders, what can the ethics of an intellectual be if not to render oneself permanently capable of self-detaching, which is the opposite of the attitude of conversion, to be at the same time an academic and an intellectual is to try to engage a type of knowledge and analysis that is taught and received in a university in a way so as to modify not only the thought of others, but one's own as well. This work of modifying one's own thought and that of others seems to me to be the intellectual's reason for being. And elsewhere, after all, what would the value of the passion for knowledge be if it resulted only in a certain amount of knowledgeableness and not in one way or another, and to the extent possible, in the knower straying afield from himself? The word he uses that is translated as straying a field of oneself is aguerrement. The, the Le Robert dictionary gives the primary meaning of aguerrement as an action of getting a distance from what is defined as morality, reason, and the norm, and the state that ensues. This definition has a certain resonance with Georges Canguilhem's conception of 
errance or to err, to wander, to stray from the norm. For Canguilum, as one commentator put it, we must move, err, adapt to survive. This condition of erring or drifting is not merely accidental or external to life, but, it, but its fundamental form. Norms are active states. Error is a condition of truth. Disassembling the self suggests a modulated version of the second part of Lee Strau Levi Strauss's definition of bricolage. In fact, the original meaning of the word, un mouvement incident, or a swerve, this incidental movement originally referred to the motion of a billiard ball caroming off of a cushion, or a horse swerving to avoid an unexpected obstacle. Foucault's Iguillemont is a slower and more meandering swerve, but nonetheless it is fair to take it as an unplanned, if reflective, avoidance or alteration of historical constituted obstacles, and as a patient disentanglement from the encumbrances of contingency. Foucault stresses the obligation to analyse historical forms that, with all their constraints and their diversity, make us what we are, and the patient labour required to reformulate them fragment by fragment in the work that lies both the necessity and the pleasure of thought. That's the end of the introduction by Paul Ravenel. After this, we will be going through the notes and terms of the translation. This is only a couple of pages. And then starting next week, next Monday, we will begin part one of this work on Foucault. If I am drawn to make any comparison of what we have just read, I would ask that our readers, everyone here currently, would look towards Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateau. Deleuze and Guattari are one of the, one of the key thinkers that take much inspiration from Foucault, and their work represents exactly something in line with an ethics and a style which Foucault very much is and is, enjoys. A Thousand Plateaus is the, is the positive and applicative project of Deleuze and Guattari's previous work in the Capitalism and Schizophrenia series, anti Oedipus, in which Michel Foucault writes in the preface to the English and American translations and publications that anti Oedipus is an ethical text, one of the first that France has seen for a long time. And he says that the century following the 21st and such would be either a Marxist or a Deleuzean century. And so I would say look to anti Oedipus and look to this, the plateau of a thousand plateaus, how to make oneself a body without organs. Here one will find very much so the applicative language of an ethics and the telos of an ethics of assembling and disassembling oneself to become a body without organs to experiment, to explore one's limits, one's shape, one's form, to lodge oneself on a stratum, and to find out what one can do, to always have a new piece of land at all times. Notes on terms and translations. The volume comprises texts written and published over a range of nearly two decades. A few were originally published in English, and several others have already been translated into English, and the majority, however, appear in here for the first time. The last category, which includes all the course summaries and self-writing, are due to Robert Hurley, a distinguished translator of 20th century French, social thought, and the translator in particular of the second and third volumes of Foucault's History of Sexuality. As a matter of principle, the editorial hand has been exercised lightly. Texts originally in English are accordingly subject to mechanical, but only to the most compelling stylistic emendations. Translations are another and more complex matter. With only a few exceptions, extant translations have proved to be of sufficient quality to merit reprinting. Even so, they vary in any number of ways with their translators. Even the most polished of translations is, moreover, far from timeless. Certain words and phrases become standard at the cost that others become misleading or seem strange. Certain early words or phrases, certain early lexical distinctions emerge as crucial only in the light of the later ouvir. Initially unexceptionable glosses emerge as controversial only in the light of retrospective discussion and debate. James Fobion's review of the available translations was undertaken with such problems in mind. His emendations are of several difficult and different sorts. The first sort seeks to highlight or clarify Foucault's usage by inserting French terms in brackets after their English glosses, when the translator has not himself or herself inserted them. 
Such terms are relatively rare, but worth noting in advance. One is episteme. It appears in English as episteme, an inevitable coinage, but a misleading one insofar as it conjures association with such apparent cognates as phoneme or lexeme. Episteme is rather a transliteration of the Greek science or systematic understanding of a conceptual domain or of an art or craft. The least troublesome of them is savoir, which can usually be glossed straightforwardly as knowledge, or in its verbal form, to know. Much more troublesome is connaissance, and its related form, connaître. Connaissance can also be frequently glossed as knowledge, indeed sometimes must be even, when its usage is not synonymous with savoir. English has no consistent way of registering the difference between that sort of knowledge that derives from acquaintance or familiarity with someone or something, connaissance, and that which is or may be purely theoretical or abstract, savoir. The lack of a regist register is all the more troublesome because Foucault's usage sometimes suggests that the distinction between connaissance and savoir is analytically pivotal. A more extended discussion of the distinction must, however, be reserved for Fabian's introduction to the second volume of the series. Fabian has also undertaken a variety of more direct editorial interventions, more or fewer, from one available translation to the next. In some cases, he corrects what seems to be an obvious error. In many others, however, he merely seeks to render more literally or move to the letter that the translator has rendered more freely or inventively. In general, his corrections have the purpose of clarifying the semantic content, in some cases the semantic ambiguity, of assertions that allow of diverse English representations. In a few cases, he has appended footnotes marked by lowercase Roman letters that elaborate upon the context of some remark or allusion. Finally, he has standardised the gloss and dispelling of a few words and phrases that take on special thematic significance as Foucault's thought unfolds. Foucault himself sometimes writes of problematisation, sometimes of problematisation, but with no alteration of meaning from one instance to the next. Translations preserve the variation in English. In this volume, however, we render both terms throughout as problematisation after problematic, especially in early translations, assujettissement uh, is often brought into English as subjugation and its related verb, as as to subjugate. Here, however, more positive usage, hence, as consistently appears as subjectification, and as as to subjectify. Les soucis de soi, getting that wrong probably, might be and has been translated into English as concern for or concern with the self, or as self-concern. In this volume, however, it has been consistently been rendered as the care of the self. Fabian has made virtually no changes to Robert Hurley's own translations. He has, however, been able to review a draft of those translations and to provide a list of questions and annotations that Hurley considered in the course of making revisions. Hurley reciprocally provided Fabian with a list of linguistic analyses and editorial advice. It is hoped that the result is a volume that might, among other things, go far in clarifying many of those aspects of Foucault's modes of expression and thought that have been lost or obscured, if not within single translations, then often enough between them. So following next week, now having done the introduction and the notes on terms and translations, we will dive straight into the works of Foucault, his books, his essays, his lectures and his seminars. Thank you for joining. This will be uploaded to YouTube where you can watch this back. Please feel free to ask any questions, and I hope to see you next weekend for the next three versions of Lacan, Deleuze, and Foucault's seminars.